Hey, good morning, everyone. Today I'll be going over IBM Spectrum Protect, our support for object storage through our cloud container storage pools, as well as some of the work that we've been putting into our cloud blueprints, which are our guidance for deploying Spectrum Protect out into a cloud environment, a cloud compute environment. So on the agenda today, to review our cloud container storage pools, explore some of the best practices involved when sizing and deploying uh, cloud container storage pools. So one of the key aspects of that is your cloud accelerator cache. So we'll get into a bit of a sizing discussion there as well as some other things to keep in mind. I'd like to gain, give you a gain insight into some of the recommendations that we have with our cloud compute deployments, looking at IBM Cloud, Amazon AWS, and Microsoft Azure. Take a look at our cloud container storage pools. So this is just a quick overview, a timeline of how we've added support for object storage over time with the Spectrum Protect server. Initially with 713 back in 2015, we launched our support with uh, OpenStack Swift as well as, so that was kind of our initial foray into object storage. Back then, we were using individual duplicated chunks for our I.O. pattern to, to object storage. Moving into 715, we launched support for IBM Cloud Object Storage System. Um, initially, at the time, it was CleverSafe using the S3-based API. In 717, third quarter 2016, we added support for Amazon's AWS S3, as well as introduced some performance enhancements, both on the backup and restore side, that helped us uh, reach some of the scalability targets that we were after. With 8.1.2, in towards the middle of 2017, we added support for Microsoft Azure. Um, third quarter, uh, 2017, we introduced the concept of tiering. And with that, you can actually move data from our traditional disk-based um, directory container storage pools to cloud container storage pools based on a particular aging storage policy. And then to kick off 2018, we actually introduced cloud reclamation, so that's the idea of cleaning up some of the unused space on the cloud end. And this chart here gives you an overview of some of our expanding set of providers and the functions that we're giving. So we have IBM Cloud on-prem as well as cloud-hosted object storage, Amazon AWS S3, Azure, OpenStack Swift. We've also added the ability for business partners and other vendors to have their S3-based object storage systems validated through us and so that we can add them to our support matrix. Several vendors have done this already, so there's a process whereby they can pass a set of functional and performance tests that we review. And if they do so, we can add them to our support matrix and then customers can use them as back-end S3 storage systems for our cloud container storage pools. Cloud container storage pools, you may already be familiar with our directory disk container storage pools. The cloud container storage pools borrow from the same underlying technology that has powered our directory container storage pools. So this is our Raven fingerprinting algorithm, the duplication engine, where the duplication is performed in line at the server rather than with our, some of our traditional file-based pools where deduplication was done after the fact as a post-processing step. Now it's in line. So the cloud pools have this as well. The LZ4 compression we've added, which is an, an efficient compression algorithm to uh, provide for greater data reduction. And that's available as of 715 in the server, 716 for client-side compression. And then you have our at-rest encryption that we've added that's available now for both cloud pools as well as directory container storage pools that uses AES-256 encryption. We have a unified engine, and so that enables us to easily move data back and forth between pools as well. So a little bit of a look under the hood. Um, initially, with our first model of cloud container storage pools, we started with taking each one of our individual uh, deduplicated chunks. So imagine your client data stream coming into the server. We have a fingerprinting algorithm that looks at the data stream and identifies patterns, kind of your typical deduplication technology. These patterns, these chunks, are usually in the realm of about 50 KB to 300 kilobytes. They can be larger in some cases. Our initial model was to store each one of these chunks individually as an object storage object. 
So our puts and gets were that granularity. This was with our initial offering of OpenStack Swift and S3 prior to 717. What we quickly came to realize is this provided a lot of overhead for the amount of data that was being stored and wasn't allowing us to reach the scalability targets we were after. So with 717 and later for S3 Majeure-based pools, so that includes IBM Cloud, IBM Cloud Object Storage System, as well as Amazon S3, Microsoft Azure, we do a somewhat different model where we aggregate these Hadoop chunks into larger uh, container files, which we then upload to object storage in a more efficient fashion. So that allowed us to get from gigabytes per hour of data protected up to terabytes per hour of data protected and got us more in line and kind of in the realm of what our disk-based blueprints were able to do. So taking a quick look here, how do you define one of these pools? From the command line, the IBM Cloud object storage system as well as Amazon S3 you do a defined storage pool, cloud pool. You give it whatever name you want there. Storage type equals cloud. For cloud type, you set S3. And then you can give a delimited list of endpoints. And so within the operations center, this is simplified for you by you're given a set of lines that you can fill out with separate endpoints there. The advantage to having multiple endpoints is internally we'll round robin distribute workload between these endpoints. So in the cases, particularly with IBM Cloud object storage on-premise, so this can help you reach some of the higher-end performance targets you're looking for. Um, you give it your access key ID as well as your secret key. With Microsoft Azure, the definition is a little bit different. You give the cloud type as Azure. The cloud URL, you give it a specialized endpoint. So I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with this, but with Microsoft Azure, you can define a blob storage account. Then you get a somewhat custom URL with the storage account prefix .blob.core.windows.net. You plug this in for your endpoint, and then our defined storage pool command for the password takes a SAS token, so a shared access signature token that you can generate through the Azure portal or um, API. So much the same, a bit different context to how the command is issued. So our cloud container storage pools, they actually share the concept of storage pool directories with our directory container storage pools, but the, the usage of this storage location is a bit different. So whereas with the disk container storage pools, the storage pool directories that you create on your formatted disk file systems is actually the final resting place usually for your data. So you want to size that. It can be, you know, multiple terabytes, tens of terabytes, petabyte or more of disk storage. Now with the cloud container storage pools, this directory space takes on the role of a accelerator cache. So what that means is that this is the area where those deduplicated chunks, those extents, are aggregated together. They're packaged up. They're combined together into these larger one gig objects that are then uploaded to object storage. So what does that buy us? That buys us two things. The front-end client backup is now asynchronous from the object storage transfer. So imagine your I.O. throughput to local disk directly attached to your Spectrum Protect server is obviously going to be faster than upload over a TCP IP network to uh, object storage that m might be located in a different lab or even a different city. What this allows you to do is it doesn't tie the performance of the object storage to the front-end backup. So the front-end backup is able to complete with the, the transfer to object storage occurring later. And it also allows us to upload to object storage in a more friendly size. Previously, when you're talking about tens of kilobytes per TCP IP transfer, the overhead of latency and packets and whatnot in that regard kind of torpedoes performance a bit. So. What this allows us to do is send with a more object storage friendly I.O. size. Uh, it also introduces an additional thing you need to keep in mind. With the accelerator cache, you have to think about sizing. What this graph is intended to show is kind of give you a sense of there's two more or less components in the mix here. So you have your network and cloud I.O. capability. So you look at the left part of the chart here. Um, oftentimes, the, the link you're going to have between your Spectrum Protect server and the object storage system can generally range, perhaps you have a gigabit network or less, or a 10 gigabit network. So like, say, imagine with your IBM Cloud object storage system 
on-premises. You may have a dedicated 10 gig network, perhaps even a 40 gig network, connecting the two the two pieces together. Uh, latency very low. And at the other end of the spectrum, perhaps you're using a public cloud service such as Amazon S3. Maybe you have a dedicated one gigabit line to to Amazon. Perhaps you're going over the the public internet WAN. Uh, oftentimes, this is going to be your main bottleneck here. So the the maximum amount of terabytes per day you're going to be able to move, probably going to be dictated by your network link or your object storage capability from the, the Spectrum Protect instance. How do you get to optimal throughput? If you have a 10 gig line or greater and you want to maximize the amount of throughput you're getting, uh, the accelerator cache, you might want to consider configuring something like Flash or SSD. Kind of the general I.O. patterns, you have incoming data coming in from the client to, to Spectrum Protect. It's being laid down to your accelerator cache. And then asynchronous from that, you have the upload of this data to object storage occurring. So there's this overlapped pattern of I.O. that's occurring in your disk system. What Flash SSD gets you is that you're able to field these incoming backups over a period of 8 to 10 hours, let's say, for your backup window. And that data can be transfer it to object storage and that accelerator cache location cleared in preparation for new data that's coming in. And you can reach kind of a steady state type of scenario. So that allows you to move data out to object storage, say like an on-premises IBM cause system, at the same rate that you're taking data in from backup. It's still asynchronous, but the rates are about the same. So what that allows you to do is achieve something in the realm of large blueprint type ingestion workload and not worry about this disk location accumulating data. There's another option as well. You can opt for slower disk technology, say 15K, RAID 5, SAS volumes, or even slower. If you're willing to let that data that gets ingested from your clients drain for a period that's longer than your backup window. So imagine that you're taking in data for eight hours, perhaps It'll take a few more hours for that data to, to drain out from this accelerator disk cache. That's an option as well if you want to opt for cheaper disk technology. But keep in mind that that might limit your total ingestion capability. If you're at the other end of the spectrum, if you're using public cloud vendors, if they're remote from your Spectrum Protect server, uh, if you're only getting one gigabit speeds, there's really no sense in using very fast disk technology for the accelerator cache. Since with one gigabit speeds, you're talking not very much in the way of gigabytes per hour being moved to object storage, the fast disk technology is not going to buy you much. It's mostly going to be idle. So you can live with slower disk technology here. Some general rules of thumb. So you're deploying an on-premises cloud object storage system. You have the notion of accessors, slice stores, that kind of thing. From our experience in the lab, if you're looking for kind of a small blueprint Spectrum Protect ingestion capability, you're looking at wanting to pair up one accessor to the, the cloud container storage pool. A medium blueprint, something around two accessors for a large blueprint, three to four accessors. What we found is that for a small blueprint level of ingestion, you're able to get close to saturating the capability of a, say, a model 3100, 3105 IBM cause accessor with that I.O. load. Start talking about medium blueprint, you want to introduce a second accessor. For large blueprint, three to four accessors. So that's to prevent the accessors from being the bottleneck to your I.O. system. There is the notion that of an Ethernet load balancer that several customers and business partners are interested in using in their IBM cause environment. Generally, we don't recommend that you present a load balancer in front of your IBM cause accessors. Internally, with the Spectrum Protect server, we actually spin up additional resources per endpoint you give us. So this is that delimited list of endpoints that the, the cloud storage pool takes in. If you're doing a load balancer for high availability purposes, generally that's OK. That's a reason that makes sense in this regard. So you, want, you don't necessarily want to use a load balancer for performance reasons, but for HA purposes. And we do present a couple of internal server options that you can set to increase some of our resource levels in that case. So if you know that you have two accessors or four accessors underneath that load balancer, we'll 
allow you to, to set a couple of options that increase the, the resource usage there so that perhaps you can approach what you'd get without the load balancer. But from internal tests that we've made, the most optimal configuration is present us with all of your accessors and we'll do the load balancing internally. So with your accelerator disk cache, some options for how you configure that and file systems for our supported server platforms, uh, JFS2, NTFS, XFS, some recommended uh, file system types that you probably want to use. As far as the accelerated disk cache, do you want to use one file system, multiple file systems, you know, one storage pool directory, multiple directories? Generally, we found that a single, as opposed to our directory container storage pools, with the cloud container storage pools, one storage pool directory, one file system is actually the optimal configuration here. And the reasoning there is that we have that overlapped I.O. pattern with incoming backup ingest and transfer to cloud. And what we found is that to minimize the amount of hot spotting that we get on the underlying disks, a single Stripe file system tends to perform better, a single Stripe volume. For example, for Linux, if you want to use Logical Volume Manager with a stripe size of 16 kilobytes, we found that that provided the best throughput. So we tried various stripe sizes in that configuration, found that 16 kilobytes happened to be best for the mixed I.O. load that we were seeing there. We also want to remember to stripe across all of your volumes, so it's an easy thing to forget with the VLVM command. You do stripes to, if you omit that, you actually could end up with a situation where all of the extents are taken from one of the volumes or the first volume or the first couple of volumes, so then you end up with hot spotting you weren't anticipating there. Benchmarking, one thing that we like to do in-house and we also encourage our customers, business partners to do is when you've created an environment, when you've built an environment out there, either on-premises or in the cloud, you want to benchmark it to see what its capability is. The Spectrum Protect Blueprint package that many of you might be familiar with, we actually include some utilities to drive this. Um, the TSM DiskPerf.pl utility can be used to, to benchmark your storage pool directories as well as your database directories. So we encourage using this tool to benchmark both in the case of using cloud object storage as well. So you have the notion of being able to benchmark storage pool directories. In, in our case, for cloud container storage pools, that means the accelerator disk cache. So you can run the utility as you see here. In practice, you might want to run it with a set of threads. So generally what the command takes in is you give it a, a directory list. As I just mentioned in the previous a couple of slides, you want to use, say, a single file system, a single storage pool directory, in the case of the accelerator cache. And what you do here is, say, create a set of subdirectories underneath the accelerator cache location. And then starting with, say, one, two, three, et cetera, thread, present those directories up as a list to this tool, uh, benchmark and see what you get. And usually you'll see something along the lines of the graph that you, you have here where you'll kind of have like a logarithmic type <clears throat> progression until you reach a, a saturation point with your disk. The kind of the annotation here with small, medium, large, that's meant to indicate that if you kind of top out at around those levels of megabytes per second. That's kind of the, the small blueprint ingestion rate, the medium blueprint ingestion rate, the large blueprint ingestion rate. So what this allows you to do is kind of see, is my accelerator cache going to be the bottleneck for throughput? Um, if I'm able to achieve that, that large line or exceed it, then I should be comfortable from the point of view of my disk accelerator cache isn't going to be the bottleneck for for ingest rates. And there at the bottom left, uh, there's a link to the Spectrum Protect Blueprints that includes this package so you can, you can pull it down and play around with it. Not only disk storage you want to worry about, but also object storage. So both could be a bottleneck in a system uh, for the ingest I.O. path. In-house, in the development lab, we've um, created a utility, a Java jar, that includes both the S3 and Azure APIs to drive um, ingest workload tests, so ingest benchmarking. So what this utility does, spobjbench.jar, is it simulates a Spectrum Protect-like workload for ingest so that you can benchmark your object storage system to see if that's going to get in the way. Here's a couple of exemplary 
executions here. So with IBM Cloud Object Storage S3, uh, you give your endpoint, your public key, private key, very similar to what you do when you define a, a cloud container storage pool. Uh, object size, uh, number of threads. Azure, it's very similar, uh, although you give it the storage account and SAS token instead. This type of benchmarking we're going to actually provide along with our Cloud Blueprint white papers targeted for the end of this month. Uh, we're going to give you a write-up as well as this tool so that you can go out and uh, benchmark your object storage environment as well to see what you get here. So similar with this benchmarking, you want to start with you know, one, two, three, four threads, um, probably working your way up to 100 threads to simulate something that Spectrum Protect does. Uh, what this will allow you to do is kind of see what do I top out at with object storage with the Spectrum Protect I.O. pattern. What that allows you to do is to you're going to see, okay, what, what kind of ingest rate can I get on the back end? So we recommend both, both disk benchmarking and object storage benchmarking for any type of environment that, that you're going to build out there. One of the earlier slides I introduced our progression of support for object storage. And with 813, we introduced the, the notion of tiering. So in this case, you actually define a, a storage rule. Uh, which is a rule-based mechanism for moving data between a uh, directory container storage pool and a cloud container storage pool. So why might you want to do this? One of the key things here is maybe you want uh, your operational recovery data, the data that you have to recover fast, that you have to restore fast. You want that living on your fast disk tier location. So this allows you to kind of create a, a tiering hierarchy. So you have your incoming back of ingest data coming in. It's stored to a disk-based storage pool. After a set number of days, uh, this data is aged off and it's demoted to object storage. So you have the ability to keep several generations of data out there in cost-effective object storage, but keeping your critical operational recovery data on disk for fast recovery. Initially with the 813 release, this is an age-based mechanism. Coming up in the future, we're introducing the idea of a backup state-based tiering. So here you have your active data and your inactive data. You can keep the active data on your disk tier. The inactive data is moved off to your object storage tier. And um, over here on the right, so you, you'll see that this tiering mechanism will work with uh, IBM Cloud, Amazon S3, Microsoft Azure, and the ready for S3 clouds, the validated cloud appliances. This introduces a different type of paradigm. So you have kind of two paradigms living side by side. You have the notion of your cloud with accelerator cache where your backups occur direct to the cloud pool. They're, they're directly stored into the, the cloud container storage pool. And then you have this idea of first backing up to a disk tier and then that data tiering off at a later period to object storage. This chart is kind of meant to represent uh, when you might want to do that. So if you have your periodic full workloads, Oracle, SQL backups, Exchange backups, that type of thing, um, generally you're doing a full backup and then differentials throughout the week, let's say. This is a very good fit for the disk to cloud tiering model. So the, the idea here is you have your backup and all of your differentials living in the disk tier so that um, any kind of recovery point you want to do within the last week is, is present there whereas all the old versions of your data are, is migrated off to uh, cloud object storage or object storage. So with a progressive incremental forever backup, so unstructured data, your file server data, media files, currently that doesn't play so well with the tiering model. So imagine that you have a certain, you have your initial generation of data and then all following backups are incremental forever. So that means if you're attempting to restore the most recent copy of your data, some of the, the pieces of that data, some of the dedupe chunks, might live in the older um, generation, the one that's already been moved off the cloud with age-based tiering. So currently, uh, you, you'll probably want to store that data direct to cloud, and it fits that model better. It doesn't really mate so well with tiering at the moment. And that story is going to change in the future with state-based tiering. In that case, your uh, progressive incremental forever uh, data here will will be a good fit. If you're seeking a small disk footprint for the Spectre Protect server, so imagine you're deploying Spectre Protect in the cloud in AWS as an EC2 instance or an Azure, you're probably going to want to use the direct cloud model just to minimize your, 
your disk cost. Block storage is usually uh, one of the most expensive components when you're pricing out a, a system. The tiering model, having multiple days worth of, of disk storage uh, might be a little bit prohibitive there. So in that case, direct cloud might be a better fit. Cloud compute with Spectrum Protect. This gets into the notion of some of the work we've done with uh, deploying Spectrum Protect into uh, cloud vendors. Deployment patterns, where might you want to have Spectrum Protect deployed in a cloud compute instance? So these are kind of three models that we would see. Uh, you have your primary backup, your primary site being the, the cloud instance of Spectrum Protect, on-prem or cloud compute. So you have your object storage system bundled together with your Spectrum Protect server. The, uh, the primary site could have the object storage or the, the cloud compute site could have the object storage. And so the second model here, maybe your primary site is on-prem in your data center, whereas your DR site could also be on-prem backing up to object storage, or the, the DR site itself could be in the cloud, in, um, in a cloud vendor with the object storage located there. Um, kind of the third model here, you have your primary site where you're storing some data to disk container storage pool, and then some data is going to a cloud um, container storage pool. So maybe you, you'd have some of your operational recovery data living mostly on the disk container storage pool with some of the older generations moved off the cloud, whereas maybe you have your compliance weekly, monthly, quarterly backups that you're not so worried about living on fast disk technology. Those would go direct an object storage back in. So there's different models you can consider here for use with object storage. With the notion of cloud compute, putting your Spectrum Protect server out there in a cloud compute instance, things you want to keep in mind. This is very similar to if you're wanting to size an on-prem solution. You want to concern yourself with sizing CPU, memory, network capability of the system. With the notion of some of the cloud vendors, you have the ability to have a dedicated instance or a shared instance. So this is the idea of there's a single host out there and your instance is a virtual machine on the host. Does it have dedicated resources or is it sharing resources with others, other systems that you might not know about? And also bare metal with, in the case of IBM Cloud, you can have a, a dedicated physical server out there. Storage, you have, look into your block storage throughput and IOPS capability. Whether you have dedicated bandwidth to that block storage, several instances in the virtual environments uh, don't have or have limited access to block storage. The idea of your network, so where is your object storage system located in relationship to the instance? Is it in the same Amazon virtual private cloud? Is it in the same location as your IBM cloud bare metal server? The bandwidth, the NIC count of your system. So all very similar items you want to keep in mind in the, in the physical realm, but with in the case of deploying in cloud compute, there's other things to keep in mind as well, other factors at play that you might not see at first. So let's go over some of those here. So one item you might want to think about is uh, what size system you should pick. So with our traditional blueprints, you have the notion of small, medium, and large. So where do you fit in in that scale? Here this kind of is meant to give you a sense of uh, both your daily ingest rate as far as terabytes per day go, as well as the amount of data that you have protected. So those are the, the two bars for each of the small, medium, and large items here. If you're looking at up to 10 terabytes a day of data being ingested into your Spectrum Protect instance, that kind of puts you in the, the small realm. Um, total managed data, 60 to 240 terabytes. The range there is meant to convey the fact that you might see uh, variable deduplication and compression savings for your data. Your mileage may vary there, but generally these ranges presented here, so 10 to 20 terabytes per day for medium, 20 to 100 terabytes per day for large. If you're getting the sense that your server is going to have to field that amount of backup ingest, this is the kind of t-shirt size that you're, you're placed into. This is where our physical disk-based container storage pool blueprints. The story with cloud is pretty much the same, um, although with the cloud container storage pools, you might only be able to reach up to about 64 terabytes per day of backup ingest. Um, you might not get all the way to the 100 terabytes per day that a, a disk-based solution will give you, but that's more or less the only difference here. And then you get kind of a sense with the, the restore section of the, the slide here, kind of what, what types of uh, gigabytes per hour restore rates that you're going to be able to see. So 
your restore rate from cloud object storage is a little bit different than what you might be used to with disk. With cloud, we're actually restoring your individual dedupe chunks to, to put your data back together. And so a lot of the times the performance of your restores is going to be based on the nature of your data. This kind of gives you a sense if you're, if you're talking about structured data um, or unstructured data or VM workloads, kind of what you're seeing there as far as um, how throughput will scale with, with session count. The cloud blueprints, the notion of cloud blueprints, currently we're in the midst of validating a set of white papers. Um, the first two, focusing on Amazon, AWS, and Microsoft Azure, are slated to be available by the end of this month. We're looking to post those out to developer works, along with the object storage benchmarking tool that you can use to, to validate your environments. And what these documents are meant to do is kind of convey some environments that, some recommendations for each of the vendors, vendor-specific best practices, ideas on creating small, medium, and large systems out there, as well as some some of our experience with benchmarking. So this is meant to give a starting point for guidance on how to build uh, cloud-based Spectrum Protect servers of your own for each of the cloud vendors here. And what we have here in the bottom is just kind of a snapshot of um, kind of example environments. So in the case of IBM Cloud, you're looking at most likely wanting to, to build out a bare metal server. In the case of Amazon, we give you some guidance on what lines of instances to use, um, what types of instances to use there. And then a similar story with uh, Microsoft Azure. They give you different flavors of instances to use, and we give you some guidance there. So we can kind of jump into that in the next few slides here. One caveat to keep in mind with, with the IBM Cloud solution is there's actually a program in place to enable you to be priced in at a lower terabyte rate for use of IBM Cloud Object Storage, both on-prem and in the, the public hosted environment. So one kind of key to keep in mind is this might offer you the ability for cost savings in the case of the IBM Cloud. Let's first take a look at the, the notion of compute. Here we're recommending the use of bare metal servers, the reason being there's also virtual servers out there. Unfortunately, they don't really give you the network capability or the access to directly attached block disk that is kind of needed there to, to achieve your ingest targets. So I think generally you get 100 megabit per second kind of link rates for your virtual servers out there. Bare metal servers, you can get 1 gig, 10 gig, uh, multiple NICs, that kind of thing. So if you're looking to build what we consider the current small, medium, and large system, bare metal server is generally a good fit. Um, if you're looking for something a little bit smaller, so something smaller than what we advertise as a small blueprint with Spectrum Protect, perhaps a virtual server will, will fit the bill for you there. Here we're just presenting our, our small, medium, and large, so bare metal is generally the way to go there. A key factor to keep in mind when you're trying to pick a server is the quantity of internal disk slots. So with the bare metal servers in IBM Cloud, they generally range from four to as many as 36 internal disks. So those are disks that are installed into the actual server chassis and made available to the system. So if you kind of actually play around with the IBM Cloud interface, you can pick your virtual server. You can also pick the various types of disks you want to use. You can combine those up into RAID configurations um, on the fly. So it's, it's a pretty powerful interface. And then they'll go off and build that for you on the back end. So this, uh, the table here, we don't have to go delve into too much detail, but this kind of gives you a, a sense of what type of system you'd want to look into for your small, medium, and large. So there's, depending on which um, IBM lab you choose, the, the choice of instances, the choice of bare metal servers is kind of, is going to vary. These are systems that we found that are good mappings to what we'd recommend. So then you take a look at a, uh, the storage piece of the puzzle. If we're talking about a direct to cloud, so this is a, a cloud container storage pool with accelerator cache. You're backing up your primary data to, cloud uh, to a cloud container storage pool, direct to object storage. What do you want to look in here? So there's several options that are available with IBM Cloud Block Storage. You have SATA, your SAS, your SSD, and you can combine it into various RAID relationships. And kind of what this chart is meant to convey is what kind of disk technology and what kind of RAID should I consider for each role in the Spectrum Protect server. So your database volumes, your active log, 
uh, your accelerator cache for the, the cloud pool. You want to put that on SSD. Uh, the three DWPD is sufficient here. Um, your database backup archive log, you can live with a, a slower disk technology, something that isn't going to be as fast. And so SATA, the SATA offering might be a good pick here. And then in the small, medium, and large columns, you get a sense of, well, how many volumes should I configure? What size? Uh, what kind of RAID relationship? Hot spare coverage, that kind of thing. These kind of give you a good, uh, good idea of what capacities you want to configure. You get a total disk count there at the bottom, so that's kind of a reminder to keep in mind uh, when you're choosing the bare metal server. You want to choose one with enough uh, disk drive slots. The disk to cloud tiering model, this is where you're ingesting operational recovery data to disk, whereas your older disk copies or your long-term retention copies are copied or otherwise backed up to object storage. In this type of environment, you want to size a larger disk container storage pool location. So here you're going to want to look to dedicating more of those internal drive slots in the server chassis to the disk container storage pool. So like say maybe you're looking for one, two, three, four, seven days of operational recovery data. You want to size the, the disk pool accordingly. This kind of changes the, the equation a bit. You have a limited number of drive slots, so you have to rejigger your storage a bit. Here we would actually move to combining database backup, archive log, and the, the container pool disk tier all into the same set of large capacity SATA disks combined into RAID 6 arrays, um, as you can see in the, the fourth row there. So we're, we're actually combining roles there, and that's to save on the discount. Your database volumes active log, they still live on dedicated SSDs. And there you get the, the total discount there at the bottom. So the, you see in the large config, that's kind of getting topping out what generally the most number of disks you're going to see for your bare metal servers out there. In each of these environments here, it should be noted, uh, size to about five to seven days worth of operational recovery data on the disk tier. If you need less than that, you can probably get by with a smaller capacity there, fewer disks. So bare metal servers recommended over virtual servers because they offer the, the faster network speeds, the, the 1 gig, the 10 gig, the dedicated links, the ability to segregate public and private. So some of the key factors here, you want to make sure that you use the private uh, connection to object storage. So actually with IBM Cloud, there's the notion of the public endpoint or the private endpoint for IBM Cloud storage. You want to use the private endpoint here. So that will ensure that your data is routed in the internal IBM network rather than spit out into the public LAN. Uh, there's also the notion of IBM Cloud's direct link. So this allows you to connect your on-premises resources to IBM Cloud. So say imagine a model where you have your replication source server living on-premises and you're replicating to a central IBM Cloud server. You might want to consider direct links so you can get those dedicated gigabit or 10 gigabit speeds out to, to the cloud. So our second cloud vendor, Amazon AWS, it's a similar story here. There's no notion of bare metal servers, but they do have virtual servers. A ton of different options here. So they don't give you complete control over CPU and memory. Um, you have to pick more or less a standard t-shirt size. It can seem a little bit overwhelming at first. So where do you begin? You want to pick instances that are EDS optimized. So that's a dedicated link to your disk storage. You also want to pick instances that have network capability 10 gigabit or greater. You want to make sure that your instance is placed in the same Amazon region as the S3 storage you're going to be using. You also want to make sure that your resources are gathered in a virtual private cloud. That's the notion of uh, kind of a private network for your, your AWS, your resources. Also with an S3 endpoint configured in the VPC. What kind of instances do you choose? So here's a, a swag at what a small, medium, or large system would look like in the AWS cloud. And actually on the next slide, kind of give you a, a better sense of kind of the range of instances we're, we're looking at here with, with Amazon. So this table kind of presents to you small, medium, and large. What are instances that would satisfy the requirements there? So highlighted in uh, Magenta are actually our preferred instances currently. So if you're going to build a small, medium, or large, those are the ones that we've tested and vetted in our lab. And ensured are capable enough to, to satisfy requirements there. The table ranges from low cost to high cost, so the, the items in the top of the table, a bit lower cost on a per monthly basis. 
go down lower and the instances kind of rise in cost. Generally, we'd want to recommend a dedicated instance rather than a shared instance, just so you know what you're getting. Uh, if you do a shared instance, it could be interferences from a, another customer that you don't foresee impacting your backup windows, and that can kind of show up as mysterious data differences. Storage, so with AWS, EBS storage is the way to go. And this is their more or less iSCSI attached storage system, so you have various disk technologies to choose from, SSD, magnetic sequential disk. The table below here gives you a sense of what should you choose. So generally, the GP2, the general purpose SSD, is the way to go. It's a good trade-off between price and performance. For database, active log, as well as the accelerator disk cache locations. IO1, that's the dedicated IOPS provisioned SSD that's available out there. That's a good fit, too, for database, active log, and accelerator cache. But the, the trade-off is that it's generally more expensive and doesn't really warrant the performance gain. So we're able to get by on the GP2 just fine. As long as you provision a large enough capacity, you're fine there. ST1, the way to go for database backup and archive log, that's the magnetic sequential disk. What you might notice here is that um, the capacities are sized a little bit larger. How generally the cloud vendors work, both in Amazon and AWS and Microsoft, is that the larger the volumes get, the, the more performant they are. So we actually over-provision a bit on capacity here just to get you the, the performance you need. Network, there's also the notion of AWS Direct Connect, so that allows you to, to bind your on-premises resources to Amazon's network. So similar reasoning here, perhaps backing up to the, the cloud system itself from your on-premises lab, or you're having a replication relationship, so you have your replication source, replication target out there in the cloud. That allows you to get that dedicated link. And then some miscellaneous items with both uh, Amazon and Microsoft, there's the notion of account limits, instance limits, disk limits. So these are things that can kind of get in the way, things you have to concern yourself with that might crop up. So if you, if you hit one of these limits and you don't know it, you might see some mysterious performance metrics, some odd behavior in your system. So just some things to keep in mind and research. Microsoft Azure, we did a similar exercise out here as far as compute storage and network go. Some things to keep in mind for the compute end of things. Definitely want to use Azure premium managed disks. You also want to make sure that your instance is in the same region as your blob storage account, your blob object storage. And the table here is a kind of a quick swag of instances that fit the bill for small, medium, and large. You want to make sure that your instance has max uncached disk throughput that is sufficient. So each of these instances do. It's one of the limits that is in place with Azure. It's kind of a similar notion to what you might see with, with Amazon. Take a look at compute. So this is a table here that gives you a sense of small, medium, large. What are some instances and instance families that might fit the bill for those, those types of roles? And once again, this chart is uh, ordered from lower cost to higher cost. So keep in mind that you want to use uncached disk, or keep in mind the uncached disk limits as well as the Ethernet bandwidth limits. Those are two of the, the primary factors at play here. And you also want to make sure that your instances that you're choosing have access to the Azure premium disks. If you look at the bottom here, one of the notes is that you want to look for S-variant instances, and those are the ones that have access to the premium disks. Dedicated instances are generally recommended there as well. Over here you have, the, in storage, you have two different types of storage accounts that you can create in Azure. One is a blob-oriented storage account, and the other one is more of a, a disk-based storage account. For your virtual machine, you have one storage account you want to configure that is has premium performance enabled. Locally redundant storage is fine. Blob object uh, storage account, a standard hot access tier LRS type storage account is fine in this regard. You can also get, a, get by with the cool access tier, but keep in mind that if you're going to be recovering data, so if you have a high level of restore workloads in the mix, that might add cost because the, uh, the egress rate from cool access tier is a bit more. And down here in the table, it kind of gives you a sense of what you want to use. So there's a little bit less of a vari variation to choose from in the Azure case compared to Amazon. So premium managed disks are the way to go for DB, active log, accelerated cache, standard managed these are the magnetic disks. Those are fine for DB backup and archive log. And once again, these give you the kind of the capacity ratios you're looking at. Generally, over-provisioned in space to get you the performance you're after. 
the reason we recommend managed as opposed to unmanaged disks is managed can live separate from the instance. If you have an unmanaged disk and you terminate the instance, it generally the disk goes away with the instance. So this allows you to move these disks around and kind of gives you just greater flexibility. And then on the network side of things, uh, Microsoft Azure offers Express Route, kind of very similar to Direct Link for the same reasons here. You'd want to use that. Say thank you and kind of open it up to questions that might have been submitted in the chat. Great. Thanks, James. Uh, Jason, anything you want to summarize from the chat or any additions you have? Yeah, no, I think we covered the questions in the chat pretty well, James. There were some questions around the accelerator cache and the notion of if you, you know, size it really large to the point where it may take several days. You know, let's say you had a, an environment where you have a periodic full once a week where there's a bigger surge of backup ingest and it might take several days to drain, is that okay? And, you know, we said in general, yes, but you have to be aware that the cache is, a, you know, a, a point where that's your only copy of the data, right? So the goal should be to, to minimize the time spent in the cache so that you can get it into object storage where there's some redundancy built into the, the storage. Of course, you know, one related question was whether you should use RAID to, to protect the accelerator cache, and the answer there is definitely that's something you want. Right, definitely. With the, in the case of Amazon Azure, the redundancy is kind of built into the the volumes that they'll present to you there. But in the case of um, your own disk solution, you definitely want to use your RAID to protect that location. And I think um, an additional piece you put in there, Jason, was you could also consider instead using the tier by age or the upcoming tier by state, which would mean you could replicate your director container and then tier it out to the cloud. Absolutely. So, James, I'd like to thank you. That was excellent material. And